Hello, namaste, and D Live Sundays are back again. Welcome to another interesting episode of the D Live dot in podcast series. I'm your host Ira Sahai, a certified metabolic health coach, a member of D Live dot in, and also its media head. D Live dot in is India's biggest, oldest, and the only award-winning low-carb platform. Founded in 2014 by Anup Singh, an engineer, a silver medalist from IIT Roorkee, and a 14th-year pill-free diabetic. In 2011, it was Anup who pioneered the path-breaking template of 100 gram carbs per day for Indians on a vegetarian diet that subsequently helped thousands of Indian diabetics find remission. Delight is the single biggest Indian low-carb platform in the world with 3,000 plus combined success stories, 2,000 plus. Original low carb keto recipes, 150 plus podcasts, and more. The D Lab diploma course in low carb nutrition and metabolic health is India's only legally tenable course. We are now the only one from India to also be CPDSO UK accredited with the global biggest 60 hours credit to our diploma course, and the only ones also from India again to be the SMHP approved CMHC provider. Anup Singh, along with Shashikant Ayengar, was also the co-organizer of the two global metabolic health conferences held from India in 2023 and 2024, which were historic events in the global low-carb space. In today's podcast, I welcome our guest, Joshua, AP Joshua, uh, who's been lifting weights for about 16 years now. But it's only after he became a diabetic in 2016 that he embraced low-carb bodybuilding. Ever since then, there's no, there's been no looking back, and Joshua has felt the strongest both mentally and physically after he embraced this path. He not only trains people virtually but also helps them get fitter and healthier. So I welcome you, Joshua, to this uh, very interesting Sunday Be Life podcast, which we have started back again. Welcome. Hi, thank you, Ira. Good afternoon, everyone. So Joshua, a lot of people, uh, <clears throat> you know, bodybuilding is one of the things that people are concerned when we talk about low carb. Let me begin by asking the first question. Uh, you know, the benefits of low carb are well known and they're my right. But how will it affect an athlete's energy level in the gym? Yeah, so a bit of context, you know, to add uh, how you introduce me. So like... Bodybuilding has been very special for me. For example, I started lifting weights to deal with my school bullying. You know, I was a fat kid and I started lifting when I went to class 10th. And that is when my parents were alarmed. You know, they were like, OK, uh, he needs to exercise. So that is when I started lifting weights and I thought, you know, it would solve my problem. And it did to an extent, but then. I sort of took it overboard. Like, I think a lot of us, you know, who hit the gym, we at first, you know, go online and we read the contemporary nutritional advice of eating carbohydrates before a workout. And so did I, you know, back in 2011, when I uh, did quite intensive gymming in my college, I used to take a lot of carbohydrates. But, uh, you know, in some time, I realized that, you know, you can't uh, just eat anything and... Uh, think you know that lifting weights will solve your problem so eventually it didn't work for me you know like no matter how hard I worked out I never felt strong in the gym I never became very very muscular and to make matters worse in 2016 which is around four five years I became a diabetic because of all that carb loading of eating unhealthy food because you know when you're a teenager in your you know early 20s you feel like a superman, you know, you want to work out and you're like, you can eat any 4,000 calories and you find. So finally, I embraced low carb as, you know, in the introduction and things have been better. And to address your question, it's, it's a myth. It's an absolute myth. You know, your energy levels don't suffer. I think it has more to do with your mentality, how strong you feel in the gym. And there are a couple of hacks like, I would recommend anybody who wants to switch to low carb bodybuilding to supplement with creatine. It really helps, you know, especially the ATP PCR pathway, which is very important and creatine enhances that pathway. Also, I've seen in my experience that, you know, supplementing with MCT oil is really good. You know, medium chain triglycerides, they really help boost your energy level. 
so yeah these two things and uh, yeah i think it's more a mental barrier which uh, contemporary bodybuilders have you know which it's it's been fed in our brain that you know carbohydrates are necessary and you need them but once you make that switch you become you know put it this way you become a more efficient machine you know mm. and then then you don't go back yeah and and you you're quite right because every um, everywhere you find this messaging of you cannot build uh, muscles on low carb yeah so what do you would you have to say to all these people even uh, i mean expected from gym trainers and you know people who are not well versed in the science of low carb yeah uh, could you give a detailed explanation um, you know of whether it's possible not possible and how okay so anybody who tells me that you know you can't build muscle on low carb and ever since i've been a member of d life you know and i've gone through the excellent modules i like to tell them about the mtor pathway you know like a mammalian target of rapamycin like it's a very important pathway for muscle protein synthesis and you need to activate that pathway uh you know to kind of switch on that muscle protein synthesis which is like the buzzword for every bodybuilder and it is very comforting to know for a low carb athlete that all you need is baseline insulin you don't need a big boost of insulin for which you need to stuff on carbohydrates like all you need is fatty protein which is what we are supposed to consume as humans and the importance of leucine like you know a basic amount of leucine is needed so yeah I, i tell people the importance of mtor i tell people the importance of training hard like building muscle is solely dependent on three things one is muscle damage second is metabolic stress and third is basically are you progressively overloading right like you can keep lifting the same weight every day but your body is intelligent right like it loves homeostasis why will it build more muscle you know if you are let's say curling every day 10 kg is your body is like okay fine there's no challenge like i will maintain that same muscle so so yeah two things you have to provide stimuli to your body in the form of progressive overload and second you need to keep in mind about the mtor pathway and have good quality of protein and little carbohydrates you know it's not like we are going zero carbohydrates in low carb we are still having our quota of you know 100 grams thanks to anup sir we are allowed 100 grams so we can have that and i think it's fine like it's been what 2016 to 8 years now so yeah i've been quite strong you know before the podcast i just benched 120 kg so you know i will disagree that you can't build muscle on low carb <laughs> So how many grams of um, carbohydrates do you take in a day Joshua? So I stick um, like I'm pretty conservative with my carbs. Like I like to stick below 100. Like honestly before I came across D life in 2021 my own definition of low carb you know through which I kind of put my diabetes into remission was around 150 grams. Like I experimented with 150 grams and i saw that my body uh was okay with it like my blood sugars are normal but you know i would i would agree that you know staying below 100 makes me feel better in the gym so like on days i don't train i go as low as 50 grams sometimes even 20 30 like plain meat and little bit of uh, fibrous vegetables but on days when i train heavy like let's say i'm training my lower body i a little more liberal i would go up to 110 120 because i'm slightly bigger in size like you know so so i hope i don't like ruffle feathers and like slightly 110 120 but overall i like to stay below 100 mm. so i'm sure m- many people would want to ask towards the end of this podcast and there will be a lot of questions so i'm just trying to cover the basic premise of what we are discussing today so that we can take in more questions sure. joshua tell me bodybuilders dread the flat look that comes from uh, depleted glyco- glycogen stores what yeah. can be done better in that case yeah so see bodybuilding is driven by vanity right like it's a false statement that men are not vain right like men are also vain and 
you can see number of grooming products sold these days you know the market size has been increasing and bodybuilding is no different you know i think ever since the arnold era it has become even more driven by vanity you know you want to look bigger probably it makes you feel more alpha so it has something to do with glycogen stores because that round look in your muscles which you see in you know in the mirror is partly glycogen it's not 100% muscle and also because you know glycogen kind of bonds with water and that makes your muscle look bigger and one of the you know downfalls of low carb which i will agree is that initially your glycogen stores fall down and you kind of look flat and that is kind of a nightmare for any body who hits the gym you know especially younger people who you know like to look big in the gym so for that i want to tell them that you know there's this initial adaptation phase wherein your you know body will start losing water a lot of water but on a, again if we come to facts a professional athlete only loses about 36% of glycogen which is very less right and i'm talking about professional athletes who train for 2 3 hours in let's say boxers professional bodybuilders power lifters but for us mere mortals you know recreational athletes so to say i think max we train is what one and half hours so we are not going to exhaust more than 25% or 30% you know 30% would be a stretch so it is not that big of problem for us however again as i said in my introduction supplementing with mct oil medium chain triglycerides especially uh in my experience coconut oil is wonderful for me and mct oil is known to be a glycogen sparer so your body will first use mct oil as energy and then probably it will go to the glycolysis pathway so so i feel when i go hardcore keto you know like every 6 months i go hardcore keto when wherein i touch 10 15 20 carbs and to you know kind of not feel depleted and feel flat i supplement with mct oil so that would be one recommendation i would give to anyone you know to avoid that flat look and to preserve glycogen so how exactly would you advise them to take it since now we are talking about it okay so you know a good way is you know when you are going really low carb like really low carb is i would call going below 50 okay. you know when you are trying to touch the keto limits of low carb i would say you know you have with your morning coffee or even tea for i haven't uh, in my experience taken the tea but with coffee coconut oil goes wonderful like i am someone who loves coconut but um if you don't like um, you know if you don't like the idea of pairing coconut oil with your uh, coffee then you can have in your salad or something like one to two tablespoons of coconut oil is wonderful it has lot of lauric acid which is one of the important uh, mct oil so yeah i think that does great for your energy levels and don't expect results you know overnight that today i take mct tomorrow i'm going to you know hit prs in the gym no you 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 have to like give your body some time right like so many years we take carbs and do all the harm in our body but we expect miraculous results going low carb just one week so i would say around 2 to 3 weeks and <clears throat> your body becomes used to the new low carbohydrate limit and then it's fine so sure we are talking about this um, the coconut oil besides what is being used in the food i mean you know additionally in the coffee and stuff like that or oh, you mean like other than what the oils yeah if somebody is already using coconut oil mm-hmm. do they need to take it additionally as well or that's fine i think uh, see i am someone who doesn't count calories when i am going completely low carb right like completely low carb if i go below 50 i don't count calories but i am slightly wary about my calories when i'm trying to really trim down my body fat like let's say if i want to go 12% then i'm counting calories i won't lie so if somebody is in that level like you you want to really trim down your body fat you know 12% 11% then i would say you have to be careful about taking extra mct because you add on calories very rapidly right one tablespoon and boom 130 calories so other than that if you know you're a regular guy who's uh 
not too ambitious about his body fat, right? Like you want to maintain 15 to 20 percent, which is a healthy range for a male and around 20 to 30 percent for a female. I don't think you need to count, um, you know, so much. Just don't overdo it, right? Like eat till you are full. That is a mantra, right? We, which we advocate to our clients. So that should be fine. Don't need to count. Joshua, tell us, uh, a lot of people have been asking us what is fat adapted in terms of bodybuilding, you know, in that context. And what does it mean for a gym goer, therefore, uh, to be fat adapted? Okay, so, yeah, fat adaptation is, again, a buzzword, right? Like for um, athletes who are particularly into bodybuilding and, you know, other athletic sports like badminton, and, you know, even powerlifting. So fat adaptation basically means that your body can efficiently use ketones, you know, beta hydroxybutyrate, acetoacetate and acetate as fuel. And it can switch between carbohydrates and fat depending on their availability. So that simply is the meaning of being, uh, you know, fat adapted. So once you switch from a high carbohydrate to a low carbohydrate diet, in my experience, it takes around two to three weeks for being fat adapted. Now, one of the very interesting things era, which, um, you know, I recently came across is people who are fat adapted have, you know, a continuous flow of energy in the body because ketones don't go in your gut, right? Like they are released from the liver. They travel in the blood and are used by your muscles. Whereas the energy you derive from the carbohydrates, they have to be first digested, right? So ketones in that sense is a faster, more reliable and continuous fuel, which your body actually prefers, provided you give it adequate time to become adapted. So once an athlete becomes fat adapted, you can continuously perform your sport without feeling exhausted as opposed to if you're a carbohydrate you know the contemporary athlete you know who takes 60 grams of sweet potato before working out and then 100 grams of oats after that and then some sugar with your protein shake you know the regular diet so have a banana in between exactly have a banana in between so yeah that i mean i was someone who did that Minus the banana, I don't like banana. So I used to take orange juice between my workout. You know, I read somewhere that if your insulin is high, that means there'll be more glucose uptake in the muscle. So yeah, I totally screwed my body. Now, you know, I developed diabetes and all that's different. So, and you feel sluggish actually. Like when you, obviously like your body is, it, it doesn't like too many simple carbohydrates. You know, it, initially you feel good. You know, you feel that kick, okay, I've had, lot of sugar but then you're not going to perform well in your sport or in the gym as opposed to ketones it's a much cleaner fuel you know so you can actually feel very alert in the gym and one interesting fact i haven't injured myself in the gym ever since i've been fat adapted because i'm more aware <laughs> you know when i was a carbohydrate athlete i kind of felt sluggish you know hitting my body here and there or you know dropping plates on my foot so I don't know if that is relevant, but that is something which I've seen, you know, I'm much sharper in the gym. I don't do silly injuries anymore. And my, sh my, my workouts have shrunk in size, like as opposed to before when I used to work out 90 minutes, now it's like 15, you know, uh, 75 minutes. So that's like good 15, 16% reduction, right? You know, so time economy is another, you know, good side effect you can say. Yeah. Because I'm you're sure. concentrated. Yeah. Yusha, the next question is, uh, can low carb decrease an athlete's strength and endurance in the gym as many believe? All right. Yeah, that's another pain point. So here I would like to touch on an important concept by Professor Tim Notes. You know, I read one of his papers and I would give all credit because I think it's a very novel concept. So he mentioned about the concept of exercise induced hypoglycemia eih so basically what he said in the paper is that our brain is only concerned about survival it doesn't care what your bench is what your shoulder press is or you know what how big your 
shoulders or you know biceps are so as long as you can maintain stable glucose levels in your body your performance will never be hit so what he proposes in this paper is that if you ingest as little as 5 gram to 10 gram carbohydrates during your workout and that's the key word because we know that our body has around 5 to 6 grams of floating sugar in the blood so if you can just maintain that and if your brain doesn't senses that you know hypoglycemia is coming and you are you glycemic your performance will never drop your endurance your strength nothing will drop because as soon as the brain senses that you know hypoglycemia is coming you know it tells the motor nerves that the muscles need to stop now you know the it's time to call it done you know the muscles have to stop and more the sugar has to be preserved for more important body functions so that was a very novel concept and i have actually tried it you know i tried um, last week i read this concept and i took some sugar with me although felt very guilty doing that being a low carb uh, you know gym goer and i won't say that you know i saw a lot of difference i have to experiment more but definitely my mood was elevated so it was all it was just 5 grams of sugar 5 gram carbohydrates and yeah my performance was fine that day so i would encourage anyone that maybe you can try this you know or people and, and yeah now that you're talking about this sugar part uh, mm -hmm. let's talk about a bit of uh, a little bit about the salt part also joshua Mm -hmm. um now what role does salt play a lot of people have been talking about you know taking salt water before going to the gym or while they are doing uh, their workouts is there any significance to it definitely so again salt is uh, it has been taking the blame right like it's actually a good guy which has been painted the bad guy because yeah. nobody profits from salt right like so so cheap 15 rupees per kg so so actually yeah like uh, it's been around one year that i have been eating a lot of salt and that really drives my mother crazy because she thinks i'll be hypertensive but my blood blood pressure has been surprisingly great ever since i have gone low carb so the importance of salt is highly underrated you know salt is very important because as an athlete and i mean let's be honest most of the parts in india we are working out in in gyms which are very hot even if the ac is running there are people lot of people in india especially in the gyms and we are sweating a lot so we are losing a lot of salt and we are not recovering it so in my experience it really boosts my performance like what i do is i take around 5 to 10 grams of salt depending on how long my workout is going to be before the workout around 20 to 30 minutes before and i also take salty water with me to sip during my workouts so that also helps i agree it's there um joshua i want to ask a very relevant question and it's been on my mind and it's constantly asked uh, you know uh, by people is it easy to build uh, muscles on on a vegetarian or a vegan diet largely vegetarian because indians are mostly vegetarians how mm -hmm. easy or difficult it is and if it's difficult then what can be done see it's it's yeah it is it is difficult but it is doable i think provided you have the will to do it you will have to put extra effort that is a given because see it is very easy for a non vegetarian to you know uh, eat protein especially i touched upon you know the importance of activating the mtor pathway right and we need leucine for that it is essential amino acid and we know that you know vegetarian sources of protein are a little deficient in leucine so i think a vegetarian has to resort to paneer which has good amounts of leucine and um, but the downside people say is you know that paneer has a lot of calories so then you have to rely on whey a lot you know two sources whey protein and paneer you need to get your leucine from somewhere to you know uh, turn on mtor <clears throat> and you have to make sure you are consuming around 1.5 to 1.8 up to 2 grams of carb, uh, protein per you know kgs of body weight if you want to build muscle because uh, you know the protein intake is very conservative in india like you know even the rda is 
which is barely anything, right? Like, it's not like everything gets absorbed by a body. So I would say if you are a vegan <clears throat> or a vegetarian, then aim for 1.52 grams of protein, preferably from paneer and whey protein, two sources which have all the important essential amino acids and train heart, obviously. Mm. That's the biggest factor. Um, Joshua, between keto versus carnivore versus the paleo diet, what are the differences and their implications on muscle building? Yeah, so these are like three different types of diet. You know, they all are somewhere in the spectrum of low carb. So car carnivore, I feel, is very few people do carnivore in India, to be honest, you know. And a lot of people actually, when they are inducted into low carb, they intuitively do what we call paleo, you know, which was, I think, um, brought by Lauren Cordain, if I'm not wrong, in 1970s. So, so yeah, paleo is, I think, what most people intuitively do without knowing that they, they are doing paleo. Even. But the downside of paleo is that, you know, its technical definition is eating up to 30% of your daily calories in carbohydrate. So for a guy like me who is eating 3,500 calories, that would mean up to 250 grams of carbohydrate. So I don't consider paleo a version of, you know, low carb anymore because of its flexible definition. So between carnivore and carnivore and keto, I would say that if you are starting your low carb journey, you first stick with 100 grams. Do not jump onto keto and uh, carnivore especially because again, we know that, you know, it takes around three to two, two, three up to four weeks of, you know, adaptation and people are very impatient, you know, when, when they jump into low carb. So I would suggest anybody who is an athlete, they first stagger their carbohydrates. They lower it, you know, first of all, know how much you're eating right now. If you're eating 250, aim to cut, cut it down to 200, then 150. Stick to 100. For most of us Indians, 100 grams is pretty doable, you know, without um, feeling that life is a compromise. And it will also not affect your performance. If your body physiology is really bad, like you're very insulin resistant and you have, you know, have other ailments, then you can go up to, you know, 25, 50, but again, in a staggered way. So I am someone who has also, you know, performed in the gym at 25 grams of carbohydrates, up to 10 grams also sometimes, like pure meat and some dairy. But that has to be staggered. It has to be, you know, within weeks, not days. Hmm. Uh, one of the questions that I received, uh, and I want to ask it at this point is, if an average active person who's going to the gym is taking, say, two grams per kg, uh, two grams protein per kg body weight, mm -hmm. does he need to take extra weight, which is extra meaning after coming back from the gym, or does this suffice? So, two grams the person is taking, right, per yes. kg of body weight. Yes. I think you and if the if the sources are good and it's good bioactive protein, right? Like the bioavailability of protein is high as in it's um, like if the person is a non-vegetarian, then I don't think. Yes, uh, a non-vegetarian, a meat eater. And this is the question uh, already taking two grams protein per kg body weight, according to his. So do I need to take additional weight after having come back from my workout or I can just do without that? I think then you know, it's, totally fine there's no need of way right like if you're taking two then it, it would be an overkill you know to be honest like average guy is 70 75 kgs in india you're taking 150 grams of protein like most of it would be wasted you know if you are going above that and to be honest most people don't train as hard as they think hmm. like, you need to train like michael phelps you know if you are having three grams of protein per kg of body weight so i think that's fine for a vegetarian i would like to see what they are eating like when they say they are eating protein is it coming from legumes is it coming from let's say paneer is it or is, is it you know dairy then i would you know probably talk about whey because if it's from paneer and dairy then i think again there's no need of uh, whey i mean if your pockets allow then it's fine but it's not a necessity it's not okay. like yeah 
Joshua, is it fine to work out in a fasted state? That is one. Is it ideal? That is two. And uh, should one continue the fast after the workout too, or one has to necessarily break the fast? Okay, this is contentious. Huh? So, see, this would uh, highly depend on what your goal is. Like, are you trying to lose fat? Are you trying to build muscle? Are you a regular guy who's, you know, just going to the gym to feel good in life? It would depend on that. But for most people, I would say, it is okay to, you know, work out in a fasted state. And I would like to again touch upon the AMPK pathway, right? Which is, we talked about the mTOR pathway, which is important for muscle synthesis. So the totally opposite pathway, which our body maintains is the AMPK. I think the full form is adenosine monophosphate protein kinase pathway, right? So it is important for, you know, fat oxidization. Like if you want to lose weight, then this is the pathway you want to target. And working out in a fasted state will trigger this pathway and you will be able to lose weight. So, but I would not uh, personally recommend, you know, working out in a fasted state if you want to build muscle. Like if, if you are um, really ambitious about building muscle. So you can maintain your muscle mass. That's fine. Like when I'm trying to cut down to lower body fat levels, then I do fast and I work out. But when I'm trying to build muscle, then I don't, you know, work out in a fasted state. However, if you're a regular guy, which, you know, most of us are, right? Like we are not, we don't have a big aim. Like we, we don't see going to the gym as very goal oriented. We are like, okay, we want to have a good body. We want to stay away from illnesses. Then I feel it is perfectly fine working out in a fasted state as long as you are meeting your nutrition, right? You, you, you have to have your protein. You have to keep your carbohydrates low. And I don't think timing is very crucial for a regular person. So it's perfect. I'll ask two, yeah. I'll ask two very quick questions and then I think we'll go to audience questions also. Mm -hmm. Joshua, please spell it, spell it out. Why should everyone... Uh, necessarily or you know ideally try to build muscles go to the gym why is it critical what are the benefits of uh, resistance resistance training over a simple walk or a brisk walk and stuff like that all right so yeah very important in indian context right like where the most exercise we call is walking most people think you know that cardiovascular activity is the only exercise they need so I would like to talk about the different types of exercise, right? Like it is, see, heart is our most important muscle. So we are doing our cardiovascular exercise for that. But then the other form of exercise our body needs is, you know, building muscle. And it is the most important real estate of a body. So the more muscle you have, the more your, you know, TDEE, which is your total daily energy expenditure, which means your body will be more insulin sensitive first of all your body will burn more calories in a rested state and the fun part you will be able to eat more right not not carbohydrates but you can still you know have more food like ever since i've built good 10 kgs of muscle like i used to be 61 now i'm 75 i can eat up to 3000 3500 calories you know without and my waist is like what 29 to 30 inches which is i think good enough so that's the second thing. Third important thing is your joints become very healthy, right? Like, and we know that once you become 40, 50, especially women, you know, post menopause and when your estrogen drops, you know, you are very vulnerable for osteoporosis and, you know, different kind of fractures, you know, one fall and your hip bone, hip bone breaks, you know, we know such stories about a grandparent. So I think joints is, uh, strength of joints is one important thing. Then we have to fight, you know, scar sarcopenia, which is age-related muscle loss. Yeah, so it's very important to build muscle yeah. these things. One quick question and then I'll take uh, Arjun's question. Um, so are there, are there any, any specific supplements that women who are on low carb and also strength training, is an average taking one gram per kg body weight protein, uh, are there any particular supplements that they should focus on to reach their goals? 
Okay, so to reach the goals, uh, I assume it is building muscle, right? Yes, I'm building muscle. Yeah. Basically, you know, you want to re-engineer your body, have lower body fat and higher muscle. So yeah, the first thing I would say is again, uh, other than supplements, the biggest variable here is how hard you train in the gym. Your workout should revolve around progressive overload. Regarding supplements, I would say you can, you know, you can take caffeine before your workout, you know, it really boosts your energy levels in the gym. You can take, um, uh, yeah, enough, enough protein you are taking and creatine. Yeah, creatine is something which I would advocate to everyone, you know, irrespective of gender. And yeah, cre creatine is again, it, it kind of, you know, spooks people, you know, it's like they associate baldness and, you know, kidney disease with creatine. But, you know, let me tell you, creatine is very natural, right? Our body makes it and all carnivores know that, you know, red meat and in Indian context, red meat, I mean, lamb and mutton, it has good enough of um, creatine. But as an athlete, you need more of it, specifically because of, you know, the energy pathway of ATP PCR, which is the quick explosive move movements you do in the gym, right? Like power lifters would know that one rep of deadlift, which you do of five seconds, it relies a lot on creatine. So yeah, I would say creatine supplementation is very important. Even people who are even people who are carnivore. See again, carnivore. If you're taking chicken, chicken has very less creatine. Egg has I I don't think it has creatine. Um, red meat, mutton. You would have to have a lot of it, like half kg, and you would get like one gram of creatine. And the more muscle you have in your body, the more creatine your body will store. So. I think it's a good idea to take three grams to four grams of creatine. Of okay. Yeah. So uh, here is the, a question from Arjun. He says, for an athlete who's also into running and prioritizes endurance alongside strength, is the low carb diet adequate? For a for an endurance runner. Okay. Yeah. So for for endurance runners, let's say marathon runners, right? Again, that concept of um, which I touched upon earlier, exercise induce hypoglycemia. So I would encourage all endurance training person to experiment with this, you know, just have five grams of sugar and see, I'm not advocating you, you know, go out of your hundred gram limit. The experiment is you take five to six grams of carbohydrates, preferably simple carbohydrates during your exercise and see how it boosts your performance. Because you will be able to maintain stable glucose levels. And then throughout the day, even if you take like 40, 50 grams, so roughly in the day you are touching 50 to 60 grams only of carbohydrates. You are thoroughly low carb and you will be able to maintain your performance. Yes. So that is one. Second is once your fat adaptation starts and once your body is able to utilize ketones easily, you will have a stable source of energy without feeling exhausted. It is a much cleaner fuel. And as I said, ketones don't have to travel to your gut. So that digestive part is bypassed, which carbohydrates have to go through. And it will be a much more efficient process, right? Like you will not feel cramps in your stomach or you will not feel sluggish, which after a carbohydrate meal you will feel. Yes. Provided you give it time. The time part is very important. And uh, Neha is asking for women workout performance and strength uh, and muscle building. What is the optimum protein? She's been taking one gram per kg body weight. So that's enough or she can ramp it up? One gram per kg would be a little less. I would say you should go at least 1.5, preferably 1.5 to 1.6. So if you're a 60 kg woman, then it would be good if you touch at least 100, right? That, that's better because one would be a little low. If you're training really hard, then I don't think one is enough. Is low carb advisable for teenage athletes? Teenage athletes, okay. That's again, very touchy topic, right? Like, I don't want parents to jump on me. But I, as much as I've read, you know, going very low carb with teenagers is not recommended because they are in a growth phase and there is not been much research but i feel if you are below 120 grams 
and you are above 80 grams of carbohydrates, that is sufficient. I don't advise going keto for a teenager. Keto, yes. Yeah. Because there's no reason for that. And there's no particular reason or goal for that. I think what Joshua is talking makes absolute sense. You can still be 120, uh, 120 gram carbs and you know, you're fine. Yeah. Yeah. So Joshua, another question. Would you want to add something to it or should I take the next question? Yeah, I would just say, you know, just again, re-emphasize 80 to 120, the sweet spot for teenagers, yeah. especially those who are, you know, playing a lot of sports and, you know, going out to the school and stuff. So that's fine. So, so what is a good pre-workout for muscle building after a fasting period? First thing in the morning, should it be carbs? Okay, so breaking your fast with a carb, with a carb meal, right? Yeah, see, one strategy I talk to my clients, you know, like let's say you are low carb and you are taking 100 gram of carbohydrates. A lot of, see, it's not a mathematical formula. Our bodies respond differently. Mm -hmm. So a lot of people, they don't feel good if they have not had any carbohydrates around the time of their workout. So I then tell them about carb timing strategy, right? Basically, you focus on eating all your car 80%. Let's apply, you know, Pareto's principle. Your 80% of carbohydrates you spread before and after your workout. Let's say if you're working out in the morning, you can break your fast with carbohydrates. Let maybe whatever you prefer. Like if you prefer sweet potato, a lot of people do that. You can have that. But you still have to stick to 100, right? It's not like you can, you know, uh, cross that limit. So then you have to be more conservative throughout the day. It works well for a lot of people. You can have your carbohydrates before the gym, some after the gym, and then skip everything. Have your meat and you know clean stuff in the evening. Okay. Um, yeah. Narsima Raju is asking, how important is it to know whether one is insulin resistant or not before starting uh, to build muscles? And uh, can people with kidney issues do muscle building? Okay. So, yeah, I would have to read probably more about that you know before answering but uh, as much as i have read you know I, and i have read about era story also you know battling you know kidney disease and it has been an eye opener for me that what we've been told about protein is a big lie right like yes. but then again i don't know like to be honest i will not say in an open forum because i don't know much about this topic but i would definitely read more about it and get back about this topic Prerna is asking how, as a woman doing yoga, <clears throat> how much protein is advisable for a 1.5 hour session? So that's a very tentative question, but you can look at I think again, if you're not doing very intensive strength training, right? Like you're not breaking a lot of muscle in the gym. I think it's good if you're taking about 1.2 to 1.5, 1.6 grams per kg. That's still required. I think even if you're not doing anything, even if you're just taking walks around your house, it is still recommended to be around 1.2 to 1.6. And if you're doing yoga, then some exertion on the body. So yeah, 1.5 would be a good idea to do that. 90 to 100 grams for most people. Trisha, what would you say is the correct age to start going to the gym or start building muscles? Yeah, so... So, I, so I'm a 90s kid. So most of us were, you know, told by our parents to stay away from the gym because, you know, mm -hmm. that would affect our vertical growth. You know, my parents used to say you'll grow horizontally, but not vertically. So I recently I've read a lot of uh, articles that it doesn't affect your, um, you know, growth. So I feel kids can perfectly train in the gym. I mean, you don't have to do deadlifts and, you know, heavy lifting and injure yourself, but definitely more calisthenic movements like pull-ups, let's say light dumbbells, push-ups, basically have some muscle in your body. You know, it's it, it it's more to have a better relationship with exercise and food, which you are cultivating in your child rather than being very goal-oriented, right? So, so yeah, I think it's a great idea. And I see a lot of teenagers in my gym these days, you know, from my society and from neighborhood societies, they are doing fantastically in the gym. And they are all pretty tall, so yeah. I feel it's a good, it's a good, great age to you know introduce your child to you know building muscle. Mm. 
So Joshua, um, uh, one question, and I think we will reach the end. I have been on carnivore, Dr. Neha is asking. I've been on carnivore for a few weeks, <clears throat> but before or during workout, it feels drained out. So I take dates, almonds, and some half banana. Mm -hmm. So is that a good practice? Also protein after a workout, is it a must? We've just answered that, Neha. So, but again, <clears throat> Joshua, would you want to answer that? Protein after a workout, is it a must? And banana and dates and almonds and all of that. Yeah, I would tell Neha that if you are having enough carb, enough protein, right? You said you're a carnivore. So that's enough protein in your diet, I think. So you don't specifically need protein after your workout. However, it won't harm, to be honest. But I would encourage you to, again, you know, take MCT oil and see how it affects your workouts. Because it is quite a fast source of energy. Because your body doesn't have to process. They are medium chain triglycerides. They break down easily. So try your coconut oil. It does affect your workout in a good way. Mm -hmm. Joshua, a lot of people uh, take whey immediately after they finish their workout. Is that the correct way to take uh, whey protein? That is one. And, uh, you know, I personally take it about, you know, maybe after 45 minutes of workout along with a piece of cheese. So mm -hmm. would you explain the logic to people or the reason why that should be done? Is it correct, not correct? See, the concept is that, you know, muscle protein synthesis, which is kind of the whole process in which your muscle breaks down and, you know, emerges stronger. The concept goes like the immediate three to four hours after your workout is the golden hour. And I remember Jay Cutler, which was the ex Mr. Olympia, you know, one of the greatest bodybuilders, he said that your body is like a sponge, you know, it absorbs all the nutrients after a workout. However, there are no conclusive, you know, research on this. But I would say it, it, it is a good practice. If it is, you know, fitting within your, you know, macros and carb range, then it is a good idea to take uh, whey and as you said, you know, cheese after your workout. Now, some people feel squeamish, you know, I don't like eating immediately after my workout. But some people really, you know, crave something to eat after that. So it, I think it's perfect. No, is it is it uh, is it mandatory to immediately have whey after your workout? Uh, mm -hmm. And if not, up till what time can one take whey? I think it's fine if you can take after one hour. One hour is fine. Mm -hmm. Maybe one and one and a half hours. But definitely, I would say till two hours. You like not after two hours. Eat something because your you know and uh, your body is basically depleted of nutrients right like if you've really trained hard so you need some protein ideally in even in a low carb you know to pair your protein some carbohydrates like maybe grams if you can do that that's also fine okay there's a question from dr arvind sabarwal how to make liver so effective that it burns fat uh, instead of carbs to carry the gym exercises yeah, so I would again tell Dr. Arvind, you know, the fat adaptation phase, right? Like wherein your body becomes very efficient at burning ketones. So you just have to switch to low carb, give your body three weeks, you know, be patient with your body. And then you will see, you know, your you will feel the difference. Whether you're a runner, whether you're someone who works out in the gym, you play a sport with your son or your daughter, you will feel the difference mm -hmm. in three weeks. Anup is asking a question. I take cold coffee with ice cream before and after gym. Is that correct? No carbs otherwise. I think that's perfectly fine. I mean, if you if it's fitting your 100 gram, you know, quota, then it's perfectly fine. I mean, he's taking cold coffee. I sometimes, you know, take uh, my favorite dessert, for example. I still take sugar free, but there is some carbohydrates. So, yeah, that's fine. Okay. So for endurance training, what level of fat intake would you advise apart from your protein and carb advice? Yeah, so when people switch to low carb, they, they know that they have to go low carb, but they forget the fat. Hmm. Because fat is the villain, right? Like it is one thing to inte intellectualize that fat is good, but still it doesn't really sink in well with us. Like most of the people around the world, not just Indians. So we have to ensure that we take adequate fat, right? Like if the calories have to come from somewhere, right? Like if you are 
eating, let's say, 150 grams of protein, which is 600 calories, and you are eating 100 gram carbohydrates, which is 400, right? So where is the other calories going to come from? So you need to, you know, give a boost to your fat levels. Like if you are eating 2,500 calories divided by nine, that would be what? 160 gram of fat, right? So initially you need to measure that because it is very easy to, you know, be afraid of fat stay away from it and then you will feel sluggish and then you will blame low carb then you will be like this doesn't work for me so you have to initially you know be conscious of your fat intake and then it becomes intuitive yeah one question from prasanna uh, please provide some input on recovery period after a one hour or decent resistant training workout for a normal guy so recovery period as in the period when you should next train, right? Like Yes, I you... think that that's what he means. Yeah. Okay, so see, that would uh, depend like on what body parts you're training. Let's say if you trained your lower body today, right? Ideally, you should not be working out the same muscle before at least 48 hours. Mm -hmm. I would say preferably 72, but 48 hours is a bare minimum. If you're able to work out before, then, you know, you've not trained hard enough. So, I would say around 48 hours is enough. Good nutrition and good sleep. If you've not slept, then take for 72 hours. That's fine. So I think uh, we've reached the end of the session. I don't see any questions anymore. Anup, uh, Shashi, would you want to come online? We'll wait for a few seconds. And if there are no questions, then we conclude this session. Anup is yeah. here. Anything that you want to ask? Anu? That's all. That's all. Oh. So I that's think, uh, uh, yeah. So somebody is asking, which is the best coconut oil in market? You want to answer that? Yeah, I forgot the brand. I'll come back to you. But I use, it is hand-pressed virgin coconut oil. I've forgotten the name. It's in my Amazon. Yeah, and Dr. Pranav, it is, it's always mentioned in the WhatsApp group also. So that uh, this question you can ask in the WhatsApp community group also. Mm -hmm. We'll answer that there. So um, with this, we come to the end of this very, very interesting Sunday podcast with D-Live, uh, D-Live podcast. And uh, this is Ira Sahai and Joshua signing off for this weekend. We'll catch you again next weekend. Bye-bye. Stay fit. Enjoy your Sunday. All right. Thank you. Take care all. Thanks.